Hello, and welcome to our webinar today. My name is Jacob Finley, along with Chris O'Brien. Hey, Chris. Hey, Jacob. How are you doing today? Doing great. Thank you. Today, our topic is selling your shop, how to grow your business's value. And we are pleased to have a guest here with us, Rick Perrin, who's a partner with B2B CFO. Hey, Rick. Hey, Jacob. How are you? Great to have you here. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, this should be a good discussion. We got a lot of content to pack in here, and I think shop owners will find this very valuable. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Looking forward to it. All right, here we go. Um, quick housekeeping. We are using this Zoom webinar. So down at the bottom, you've got some controls. There's a Q&A button if you want to ask a question or ask us in the chat. So to kind of practice that, if you could tell us what do you like better here in the look? What resonates better with you? So in the chat, just give us an A or a B. And that's good practice for asking questions during the webinar. If you have any questions during the webinar, feel free to um, ask them at any time. And we'll try to get to them during the course of the webinar. And then we have time reserved at the end. Any questions that we don't get to, as always, we will um, uh, follow up with each question uh, individually, make sure they're all answered. So appreciate that. So that's there. And then quick disclaimer, the information in this presentation is general in nature for specific advice. Please consult your tax accounting or legal professional. Um, this should be valuable for you as general advice though, but obviously for your specific situation, make sure to consult with your professional. What we're going to cover today, how is your shop's value calculated? We're going to cover three different methods for calculating the value of a shop. And then how do you start increasing the value of your shop today? Then how do you successfully and profitably sell your shop? And then as a bonus, what to look like, what to look for if you're out purchasing a shop and then we'll open it up for Q and a. So here we go. First off, how is your shop's value calculated? This is a mystery for many, and there's many different ways to value a business and to do the math. Um, I'm going to launch a polling question just to gauge the audience here. And the question is, do you know what your shop is valued at today? And so if you could respond to that and uh, that'll help us know. So it's yes, no, or not sure, but I have a rough idea, or I don't even know where to start to figure out its value. And we'll let those responses roll in. Um, depending on the type of business, there's different valuation formulas. And then as you narrow down to maybe even the industry, the factors shift once again. Yeah. I think the baseline is running a P and L, right? So we've, we've covered this on other webinars where are you planning each year? Do you have a P and L? Do you have a forecasted budget? What are you doing to actuals? Those are kind of the fundamentals to getting to a value. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to end this poll. I'm going to share the results. It looks like. 46% um, of attendees are not sure, but they have a rough idea. 32% no, 14% are yes, the, they know. And then there's some 7% who um, don't even know where to start to figure out its value. So appreciate the, uh, the sharing there. Hopefully we can help out. Yeah. So here we go, valuing your shop. So three potential methods to determine the value of the business. And we're gonna, we're gonna dive in deeply in each three of these. And Rick, um, who does this all day long, um, Rick, you're going to be able to provide some very valuable color commentary. So looking forward to this. So the three we're going to cover are annual net sales plus assets, SDE, which is seller discretionary earnings, and then EBITDA, which is a um, semi-good abbreviation that stands for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So we're going to cover those three. So here we go. We're going to start with the first one. So annual net sales plus assets. So Rick, what in the world is this? Sure. When it, when it comes down to uh, the value of your company, it, for the most part, it, the, the most important thing is how much money you make and what your sales levels are. Those are the, the primary, but there's some common benchmarks. The, the first one, annual sales plus net assets, is a you take your sales, you take about 30 to 40% of your sales. So if your sales are a million dollars, that would be the three to $400,000. And then from then, from there, you would add your inventory and you would add the value of your real estate, uh, land and buildings, not the equipment. The equipment is part of the building uh, or is part of the, uh, uh, part of the deal. But- uh, Is equipment part of the building or considered part of the inventory? Uh, the equipment is considered part of the business itself. Okay, interesting. Uh, yeah. 
because you need those assets to, to generate to that. operate. So a DPF cleaner, different stuff like that, parts washer, et cetera, and all those. Yep. So you do you add the uh, value of the equipment into uh, the whole equation as a separate line item? So no, it's, no it's, it's included in the it's included in the calculation of thirty to forty percent of your sales, et cetera. Okay. So, so yeah, it's you've got a, you've got assets that are creating the income. And so those are some of the assets creating the income. The building and real estate is really separate because that's more, uh, it's more the infrastructure or, or, you know, that you could go rent. You could go rent a building. You could go, you know, rent some land. But all of your little pieces of equipment uh, are, are specific. So they're, they're not an add back. Makes sense. Rick, do you, do you often find that the land is worth more than the business itself and the, the annual sales and inventory? Uh, it can, it certainly can be, it certainly can be depending on your location, 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 and, and yeah. what other we, things are going on around you. We interviewed somebody on our podcast, Diesel Stories podcast, who sold his shop, not for the business, but for the value of the land underneath, which was a little bit mind blowing because he was doing really well on the business. Like, why not relocate? But that's, that's how sure. he rolled. He did reserve the right to reopen the business, so he didn't yeah. give up any non-compete, but sure. interesting situation there. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so I corrected that. So that's including the sales figure. Thanks for pointing that one out, Rick. So that's one method. And by the way, we're going to go through these three methods, and then we're going to actually look at a uh, valuation calculator that we'll give to all the webinar attendees so you can do the math on your own business after. So yeah. we're going to go through these three methods, then we're going to switch over and look at the calculator and run through some scenarios. So, so that's one. So the next one, seller discretionary earnings or SDE. So talk about this one, Rick. Absolutely. This is probably uh, one of the uh, more uh, applicable ones. So seller's discretionary earnings is really uh, what it says. It's the earnings or the amount of money that the owner took out of the business. So it's the salary, it's the benefits, it's the uh, net income of the organization, plus, you know, adding back um, interest and taxes and depreciation, et cetera. So it includes, um, it includes if you've got a couple of cars or you have your, you know, some, you're paying your kids or you're paying, you know, other, other things or you're charging other, you know, things to the business that really don't belong in the business as much, those would always be, those would all be added back. So it's really the total compensation that the owner is taking out of the business. Makes sense. And would that be like, if you're doing, you know, there's a, uh, you, you host parties or get togethers for customers and you've bought a elaborate boat or a, a house, or a lake house or something, would those things fall into discretionary earnings as well? Well, anything that basically think about it as what the next uh, owner would, would have as an expense. So if you've got to buy an expensive boat, that boat is not part of what's needed to run that operation. And so, yeah, I mean, you would add the boat back. Um, if you're, you know, I mean, the cost of a party, of course, you have to have parties for, you know, your, your uh, customers, et cetera. Or if you have customer parties, that would be an ongoing expense that would be, it wouldn't be an ad back because it would be more of a marketing expense. Mm -hmm. but, um, the things outside of normal um, that you might do that the next owner probably wouldn't do or that are more personal in nature. You know, some people have their their spouses on the on the payroll. And now if the spouse is doing work that is valued equal to what they're being paid, then that has to stay in. If they're getting paid $25,000 just to have their name uh, you know, on the business, they're not really adding value, then, then that, would be, uh, that would be added back. Great the other sense. thing with, with each of these, um, th there's, there's a concept of, uh, of, of normal compensation. And so if the owner, for example, is taking out 200,000 a year uh, as a salary, but normally an owner of a, uh, uh, the business manager, or the owner of the shop would earn a hundred thousand. Then you could actually add the other hundred thousand back as well, because it, it, the business P and L needs to reflect 
what a normal uh, expenses would be of that business. And yeah. so if you're, if the owner's only taken, let's say 10,000 out and it, it, then you might actually have to charge the business more or reduce. And, and this is not only SDE, but this is EBITDA and the other methods. You would actually have to adjust EBITDA or SDE uh, to get a, a fair uh, salary for, for the employee or for the owner. Makes sense. And once again, we're going to look at a calculator here in a minute. So it should make sense of all these terms. We did have one question, Rick, here, uh, just going back to method one briefly um, from Pearl. What if you are only mobile, so no building or land, where does the equipment fall then? Is that part of this, for example, part of the service truck? Where would the service truck and so forth land on this one? Yeah, that would be... Um... Because these things are bad. I mean, these things cost. Yeah, it, things that's, plus. Yeah. all of these are, you know, all of these are kind of benchmarks. So we'd have to kind of take a look at that individually. Um, you know, if you had a service truck, um, you know, we might look at it a little bit differently. Um, I'd have to think about that a little bit. Sorry. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, yeah, no problem. Yeah. So the third method we're going to take a look at is straight EBITDA. So EBITDA, meaning it's your earnings before interest expense, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, which is not common. Um, this is really similar to the last one, right, Rick? It is, except uh, the, uh, the seller's discretionary earnings is really more of, of what the owner takes out of the business, uh, in, in, you know, including the salary and, and the net income at the end of the day. EBITDA is used mainly by, uh, you know, it, usually it's larger companies, it's larger, probably, you know, uh, real large shops or, or dealerships where there's multiple shops um, getting over, you know, maybe even over, let's say a million dollars in, in uh, uh, EBITDA. Um, but it, so, so, so it is a little bit different. It's kind of for a larger organization yeah. where you don't, right. the, the owner's right. not necessarily like pulling money out for a boat and so forth and right. justifying right. a business expense in some way. Right. Okay. Makes sense. Yep. All right. So with those three methods, what we're going to do is check out our shop valuation calculator. And uh, like I mentioned, this is going to be available to download after the webinar. Um, so I'm going to bring that up and show it here. And this is what it looks like. Uh, actually, let me change the view here just a little bit. This is what it looks like here. So this is a valuation calculator for a shop. So what we have here is all three methods are laid out here in columns. And then we take the average. And uh, so for this example, what it, what I'd like to do is put in some sample information. And uh, when you get this calculator, all you have to do is put values into the gray shaded fields. And then if that value is used later on, we don't make you put it in again, it just grabs it from the other field. So for example, let's say we have a shop with, um, Chris, give me some numbers. Um, shop 1.2 million in sales maybe. Yeah. And then there's some- Smaller dis shop, yeah. Maybe there's some discounts, returns, allowances, so on and so forth. So we have, some of that in here. So maybe net sales of 1.180, 45,000 inventory. What's a more reasonable number there for a shop's inventory at 1.2 million in sales? That's probably fair. That, I mean, it could be, yeah, it, that's probably fair based on everything we're seeing. It's actually even probably high for some because a lot of folks, even with that, I mean, that's not a lot of sales and generally speaking. It's like 100,000 a month. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. it's probably hopefully even. It's, hopefully it's lower than that. Yeah, yeah. Maybe 20, 25,000 if, if they're doing a, a JIT, right? Because you're not stocking a lot of stuff at that rate. And then you've got maybe 200,000 for land and billing, which seems low. Maybe that's a 500,000. Or it could be that's where the service trucks come in. I think that's where that would probably put, plug into that other question. Yeah, because you can, Rick, you could sell a service truck. Like if you have a fully loaded service truck, there's sure. a market for those things. Oh, yeah. Of course. Um, so that that one feel unless the business is generating its money solely off the service trucks, then it kind of feels like you know these are tied in, or I guess they would have separate value from the the production of the revenue. So so this could theoretically that could be five, four or five service trucks right there or less yeah. making up the 500,000. Okay, so in a scenario like this, with the annual net sales plus assets, so we have net sales here, and then we have the assets like we talked about. Um, what, walk us through what we're seeing here, Rick. 
Yeah, <clears throat> basically the, um, and again, I want everybody to, to realize these are three different methods. It depends on your business. So uh, number one is probably, the, the first uh, one is probably yet less used than, than number two, which is, and, and number uh, the EBITDA is probably the, the least. But what we're doing is we're taking a million two for the sales. We're multiplying them by 25% or 40%, somewhere between 25 to 40, you know, 25 to 30 to 40 percent of sales. And so then we're taking that number and then just adding. Be, just to be clear, Rick, so we're taking the net sales number and we're right. multiplying it by 25 percent here and 30 percent right. there. OK, right. Then we're adding those numbers to the inventory land and buildings. OK, so in this case, on the low end, if we do the 25 percent, this one is valued at 820 at the high end, it's right at about a million. Right. This example. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. So when you get this calculator, you can just plug in your numbers here. It'll give you that range. Okay. So let's look at the SDE. That makes sense. So SDE, same situation. Let's say we have 125,000 net income. That's about 10% margin. Ideally we're seeing closer to 20%, but let's say that's it. And then we have 1200 in interest. We have some taxes, depreciation, all this stuff is in here. So that when what we're basically doing is saying we're what's our net income, and then when you add back all this other stuff, the EBITDA stuff, interest taxes, depreciation, amortization, plus the owner's personal expenses, and this this number might be what Chris is ten thousand reasonable. For that? that that won't even get the first Harley from what we're <laughs> hearing, or the right. first uh, truck. So. Maybe it's like fifty k yeah. or something. It's probably yeah easily that. So this is EBITDA plus the personal expenses. So we take that and then tell us what's going on here, Rick. Right. D depending on your shop and, and the buyer and, and how all the other things are in your shop, uh, the, that multiple could run from anywhere from, you know, uh, anywhere from, you know, one and a half to three times multiple. So we're basically multiplying the 193 times the low multiple or the high multiple, depending on, you know, how nice your shop is, you know, how your, how your historical numbers are. Um, and, and so basically it's the 193, 700 times the 1.5 or the three to get your low and high numbers. And you can see those are pretty substantially different than than we get with the annual net sales number. Makes sense. So as a rule of thumb, if you're just kind of doing a back of the envelope or whatever, if you if you know what your uh, EBITDA is, so your income before covering all these expenses, basically multiply that by three, one and a half to three, somewhere in there, it's like three X earnings is the value of my business. That's kind of the rule of thumb, right, Rick? That's right. You know, and usually, uh, just as an example, SDE of maybe uh, 150,000, 200,000 or above might get you closer to the to the to the three times. Um, you know, the 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 higher the SDE, the higher it, it that the multiple kind of goes with that because uh, a, an organization that makes more money uh, is just. Or, and, and is uh, is larger, just kind of has a, a, a tendency to sell for a higher multiple than a, a really small shop. You know, there, there's certainly exceptions to that, but the, the higher multiple usually uh, comes with a higher SDE. Now, Rick, we, we've seen some small to medium businesses actually go debt free, like pay for everything, like service trucks are owned, building is owned, uh, whether that be through some sort of inheritance or not mm -hmm. taking personal expenses out. We often hear, you know, that, um, you know, a debt free business could be worth more than your standard. I is there another multiple out there for a debt free business where there's, you know, there's, there's no. Well, the debt free, normally people, you know, for the most part, a lot of people uh, or other companies don't want to buy the organization itself. They often buy the assets of the organization. So the debt really doesn't come into play that much, Jacob, because the, that was the seller, the <laughs> seller is going to get, this is how much it's worth because this is what it's generating, right? And that's why we're adding back the interest. 
because we want it before the interest because the new the new owner might come in with cash and might not have interest and so we want to we want to keep the financing out of the calculation that's why we add that back add that back in but if if your owner if your seller just happens to be you know have it very hocked up on debt that's not going to make a difference to the to the buyer and how much he's going to pay for it because the buyer is interested in how much, um, you know, how much is this going to create in value for me? How much SDE am I going to get when I run this business? Um, it, it matters to the seller because he's got to try to get more to get his debt paid off. But that really doesn't the the you know I, I guess the only reason that the buyer would be possibly worried is if he sees that. You know the the shop is so full of debt that maybe it hasn't been run right. It ha, you know things haven't been kept up. Uh, it makes you question. You know are these earnings uh, that we're seeing really accurate? Uh, you know why why is the owner so full of debt on this thing? But otherwise, if I'm buying it, I don't really care what you know how much you get at the end of the day. This is what I'm willing to pay for it based on what it's going to create in earnings to me. What I've seen in my past life um, as an accountant and auditor dealing with um, business acquisitions and so forth is that when you consider the, the consideration and considerations like cash or, or stock or whatever, I mean, in a case like this, it's typically going to be cash. You're writing a check, you're buying a business with, with the check. Um, when you look at the purchase price, let's say it's a million dollars right here, the high value. <clears throat> If this shop here um, has zero debt, then um, you're, basically, you're basically buying the whole thing for a million dollars, a million dollars cash. If this operation here has half a million dollars in debt, which you are expected to assume as part of the purchase, what you would do is you write a check for half a million and then you assume the, the half million that, debt is the remainder of the purchase price. That's correct. Your, your purchase price is gonna be the same. Well, so your consideration adds be, up to no. Right, your consideration is going to be different. And if you assume the debt, again, that, that certainly happens sometimes, but a lot of times people don't want, uh, they, they do an asset sale versus a stock sale. The stock sale is best for the seller. The asset sale is best for the buyer. But with an asset sale, you don't get any skeletons in the closet. You don't get the liabilities that, that might be out there, you, might, you know, whether it be environmental or, or other potential lawsuits. The, uh, uh, so a lot of buyers want to want to buy the assets. And so, the, the, but if you do buy the stock, then yeah, you, you will end up assuming the, the uh, debt and you'll offset that with the amount of cash or, or other consideration. That's perfect. That's exactly what I was looking for. That's a great clarification. Actually brings, and we have a whole slew of questions here, Rick. So we'll mm -hmm. spend a little bit more time on this. Um, uh, that brings up a good point. So if you're, if you're, um, you, you always want to be paying your payroll taxes, right? Um, if you're in the U S and Canada, same concept, um, and sales tax where you need to. So anything that you might be maybe fudging on in that area, it will massively pay off to just get square with whatever regulatory body um, is involved. Because when you go to sell, like you mentioned, Rick, more likely than not, the buyer is going to want to buy the assets, not the entity. So you're going to still be stuck with the legal entity and any potential liability that may come from a future tax audit or whatever. Right. Yeah. I wanted to throw one other thing in here, Jacob, that I, I think a, a number of people uh, don't realize, but I think it's important um, because the SDE, and, and the earnings, it, it really comes down to how much money does this does this shop make? I mean, and how much money do we take home? Uh, we, we do want to look at the value of the assets. We do want to look at the value of the inventory. We want to look at uh, all these different things. But it, at the end of the day, it comes down to somebody wants to buy that to make money. And so the um, one of the things that some uh, business owners do is they say, you know, I, I've got some cash sales here that would be easy not to report. And I, I'm not, not saying that people would do this or I'm not saying that you know, any, any of the owners would be uh, you know, trying to, to do anything illegal, but I just wanna show you why, how that could be uh, a negative. So if in the middle of the case, if we had 193,000 
And we, let's say we uh, were able to take $25,000 out in cash, uh, cash sales in the year um, and, and just not recorded in the books. And, and, and again, I, I know this is kind of off color a little bit, but uh, I want to show you what will happen. So now all of a sudden is our, when we go to sell and we, we can see that our income has been lower the last few years by 25,000. Well, now that 193,000 is more like 160,000 and I get a three times multiple. You just lost your three times multiple on your value. So uh, again, I know everybody is honest on this call and everybody is uh, wants to do the right thing, but it can really backfire on you by taking cash out of the business. Yep, makes sense. Yeah. Um, we have another question here uh, pointing out. So in, in this set of facts here, uh, the SDE model, the value is significantly lower, almost half the value of the annual net sales and assets. Where, where does the value of the inventory in the landing building come into play with the SDE method? Because if the if they really have a shop that's yeah the the SDE method um, yeah it looks we we didn't bat, we we have to add the inventory and real estate into the SDE method so well. it's considered kind of separate separate yeah. to it yeah. yeah gotcha all yeah. right yeah I, I didn't notice that when we were looking at the calculator yesterday but yes another question on the SDE method here um, where does the family salary get added is that that's considered part of the owner personal expenses or if family is working in the business? So if family is working in the business and it's part of the, you know, uh, they're, they're a technician or a bookkeeper or whatever, then that's just part of the net income. The, the, uh, it's, it's all, the only thing that it gets add back as owner's personal expenses are if the, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're outside and there's, there's expenses outside of that. I, I, I guess the when you say family, um, the, the the wife's compensation as long as it's market comp yeah. and the, the wife is working right. in the business in a role that would need yeah. to be filled after the purchase, right? Right. right. Yeah. yeah, makes sense. Um, and a couple other questions here. So on the mobile question, when we we're so. Just to reinforce the point, the difference on the land and building between SDE and the annual net sales, you're basically saying, look, the value is the 581 plus the value of the land. Right. And yeah. Yeah. That's trucks. And yeah. Well, then you're not so far off. Right. Yep. So just you're, pretty, you're actually pretty darn close, aren't you? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's amazing. Like at the end of the day, it's roughly the same um, kind of range. Another uh, question here, just to follow up on the mobile if the business is generating sales solely from the service trucks, then you got to think that the this the value of those trucks um, would that be considered part of the EBITDA value, uh, kind of of the business, or would that be considered like land and building? Um, you know, potentially the value of the truck itself, but the equipment inside of it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, the equipment inside of it, probably not because under the normal method, you know, the equipment is included in the net income, you know, uh, multiple itself. We're not adding equipment back there. So perhaps the truck itself, but you know, if, if you've got, you know, a, a lot of, you know, all of your meters and your computers and all of those kinds of things, you would you you're going to have those to create that net income anyway. So um, we're we're not going to pay you for the truck and then also you know for the net income. So you know maybe it would maybe it would be. Uh, uh, so I I guess I just don't see that as it's kind of uh, it's kind of like this. If you actually own the land and building, you could be leasing that, and then that would right. just be an that's expense right. on that's your right. PL, the lease expense. The fact that you bought it and you've been building up the value there, that is a separate asset that may or may not go with the business. Maybe you right. stay on as the landlord, right? right. Whereas yep. the trucks themselves, you could make the argument either way. I guess it would just be part of the negotiation yeah. with the buyer, right? Because you could also yeah. lease them the trucks, but you know, is it equivalent to land building? Not really, but you can make the argument. Yeah, right. that's kind of where I was going is it, you'd almost, uh, you, we've seen it a couple of different ways where it's just considered those assets. We were just talking to a local shop owner. They were assets as part of his transaction. Yeah. 
So if you're, um, if you're going out to, to buy a business and uh, the understanding is that those assets will be part of it, when you close, they better be there. Right. And in good operating condition and so forth. Um, makes sense. And then uh, one more question. What, you mentioned that SDE um, and kind of these EBITDA related models are more common than the annual net sales plus assets. And is that the case? You're seeing this more, it's basically based more on cash flow than the asset value. Yes. Yeah, I, I would say so. You know, so the, the, most small businesses where the, uh, you know, the earnings are under, let's say 500,000, even sometimes higher, they're based on, you know, many times based on seller's discretionary earnings that the, the new owner wants to come in and see, okay, hey, how much I, I've, I've been making a hundred and a quarter, you know, in this other job or $80,000 as a technician, but I got money that, you know, I, I, I've been saving or I got as an inheritance and I want to go buy another, another shop. And so how much am I going to be able to take out of there as my discretionary earnings when, when I buy the shop and I run it myself? And, and so it, it really, uh, you know, they're, they're similar in a way, but how much, how much earnings can be taken out to enjoy, at, at, you know, at, as income is, is really uh, where most of these are for the smaller and mid-sized shops. Okay, fair enough. All right, some additional things to consider that depending on the nature of your shop, are you an independent, are you mobile, are you a dealership? Um, that may also impact the multiple, right, Rick? Absolutely. Uh, again, size matters uh, in, in this. So if you're a dealership and you have multiple shops, your sales are going to be higher, your EBIT is going to be higher, uh, your, your SDE is going to be higher. And as we said before, uh, there's just something that, the, you know, the higher valued uh, to a point, the higher uh, EBITDA values, the higher SDE values give you a little bit of higher multiple. So maybe uh, owning the, in, you know, a dealership could give you a, a multiple of three and a half or four instead of, instead of two and a half to three. Because there's value so, in the dealership that's earning it. Maybe the, yeah, the brand is yeah. it the, the logo or the brand that you're representing and the reputation. Is that all right. kind of thing? Everything's yeah. everything's bigger. You've got more, you know, girth for for uh, you know for probably have more bar borrowing power, et cetera. So yep, agreements in place are definitely part of the consideration. And then everything's off the table when you're negotiating, uh, depending on geography, location. Mm -hmm other agreements that might be in place, right? So this whole negotiating um, could drive the valuation even higher. Yeah, absolutely. You know, at the end of the day, as we've said, it's what the buyer's willing to pay. You know, these are common benchmarks just to get an idea and a starting point. But obviously we want to get, you know, get valuations, you know, uh, sometimes the valuations change, you know, the numbers that I gave you, you know, a lot of these numbers are, are based on some 2020 sales. You know, has COVID changed anything? You know, uh, I, I, I'm not. Uh, you got also. You got also. Valuation. So you know, th there are people who would just say, "Oh man, I want that shop. I'll pay you four times." Or, you know, you you may just not find anybody in your market that wants that, and they'll only pay you two to two and a half times. So it it really, it, it's just like selling a lot of things. It's what the buyer is willing to pay. Um, and, and how long you're willing to wait to, to get the price that you want. Makes sense. So uh, let's continue the discussion here. So now that we know roughly how a shop is valued and we'll share that calculator, how do you start increasing the value of your shop today? And um, there's many ways to do this. We're going to, we're going to go into these six different kind of levers that you could pull as a shop. But before we do that, the most important way to increase your shop's value is by actually increasing your top line revenue, so your sales. So increasing your sales and increasing your profit. Can't underscore that enough, right, Rick? Absolutely, absolutely. And the, uh, because that, that drives your SDE, right? So if you have higher SDE or higher uh, EBITDA, then those multiples get applied. 
then you obviously look at other things like, you know, what kind of shape are the financials in, you know, our employees turnover, what kind of software do we have? What's the reputation and parents and market? Those are all certainly important things that are going to be looked at, but that we're, we're going to start with, Hey, how much money could I take home if, if I was, was able to continue to run this uh, like it is? And as far as sales and profitability, that really gets down. I don't think we have another slide on, on that piece, but that really gets down to your marketing. You know, in, in this day and age, it's all about, you know, uh, the um, uh, online, uh, online marketing, uh, your, your website, your driving, you know, driving uh, more sales to you. And then on profitability, one of the most important things you can do is, is really in your financial statements and, and all of your uh, financial is really understand your profitability. Where do we make money? Where do we not make money? And that relates back to pricing. It relates back to how we price our parts. Um, it relates to how efficient are my technicians. And so managing all that and looking at that and trying to understand you know, uh, can we get to 8% on the bottom line instead of 6% on the bottom line? Really understanding what those drivers are is, is critically important. And then uh, try to break down what I call your margin. So your margin is your revenue less your direct cost that goes in that. And so for a, for a, for a part, it would be the sales price of the part less the cost of the part. For the service, it would be the revenue from the service less the cost of the technician. And so, you know, and that's before all of the other overhead. So do we understand in our shop, you know, uh, what our margins are for the different types of services that we do? Do we understand which technicians are better? Do we have some technicians that are really efficient and get things done really quickly? And they're actually very much more profitable than some of the other technicians. We need to understand that um, maybe we, you know, we want to keep the, the lower efficient technicians uh, because it's hard to get technicians and, and they're good people and they've got a lot of knowledge, but um, we got to understand maybe they aren't bringing as much to the bottom line as the others. And so, uh, so lots finding of a way to make more money um, through sales and running the shop efficiently uh, is critically important. So. Chris, yeah, oh, yeah, I was just going to say too. one of the things with the financials or just the finances, understanding where your business is, you know, a three to five year, just showing where your plan or, you know, where, where you've been trending. I think that's critical. So for those that ha don't have a clear understanding, maybe just start with tax returns, start pulling together what your, what your revenues are for the last three years, trailing last three years, what you're forecasting for the next two years. Yeah. We have a lot of good content. Um, so to your point, Rick, about, you know, increasing your, your labor margin, your labor rates, getting better margin there, uh, having a better parts markup scale to get better profit there, that goes into play. And then what you just said, Chris, I mean, it all goes into the mix. You start keeping the records now so that when the time comes, there's no red flags, uh, no gremlins in the data and so forth. So definitely get your finances in order. If you are not currently running a PL statement, there's a simple one you can run it full way. There's other tools that you can connect to our software if you're using it uh, for that. Um, make sure that you're doing a nice, clean close at the end of every month. So you know exactly how did we do? All right, new month. Let's see what we can do this month. Exactly. Right? Close out the month, um, follow up, close checklist and so forth. And then Rick, you got to think that, especially in the commercial repair space, understanding the business that we're in as a commercial repair shop helps us to put together um, certain things that create recurring revenue. Because mm -hmm. as I track the preventive maintenance for my customers, and they trust me to do this, I have this stream coming in. You got to think that multiple streams for recurring revenue like that in place would further increase the multiple that I see on the valuation, right? Yeah, it, it, it does. Companies that have recurring revenue, meaning they're, you're, you're not out there looking for that next sale, you're not hoping the next customer walks in the door, uh, you know that you can, you can almost look at your history and see that we've gotten this amount from insurance companies or this amount from uh, the ABC company fleet. And uh, the, the more recurring revenue that you can get, the, the more comfortable the new buyer is going to be that that business is going to continue, that, it's, that, that the sales are going to be good. 
And uh, so uh, increasing recurring revenue, and, and there's a number of ways, obviously, to do that. As far as the books go, just real quick on the books, everybody should have, uh, keeping books is, is pretty easy these days. And if you don't want to do it or have a bookkeeper, uh, you know, hire an accounting firm or a bookkeeping firm to do it. But because accurate financials, they're really for two things. It's not just, um, it's one, so you can understand where you make money, how you make money, and why you make money, and where, you know, how, how where, and why you make money. And that's really important, not for the banker, not for selling your business, but for you internally just to know, hey, where do I make money and how can I make more? The other thing is if you don't have good financials, at least two to three or four, probably three plus years of good financials, then the potential buyer is going to vastly reduce the, the, the price that, uh, that they're paying you because they're not going to have confidence in the number. If you just hand them you know, a bunch of pieces of paper that says, here's how much money we made, or even a tax return, and you show them the tax return, there's a lot of things that could have gone in there that could have been played with. And so the buyer wants to look at two to three to four years of, of financials, detailed financials, and he wants to have confidence in those numbers being right. If there's anything that says that those, you know, that that confidence is less than, you know, less than high, then you're going to reduce the amount that you get for your business. Makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. Another thing to keep in mind is your local market. So is there a lot of competition there? Are you in a good location? And we talk about this, this, at the end of the day, these factors that we're going through, so market, um, the employees that you have in place, do you have high turnover? Do you have good techs in place? You got to think in today's day and age, having good, efficient and proficient technicians in place um, goes a long way. But all of these factors drive what what is the multiple? What Whatever method you're using, is it uh, one and a half X, two, three X or higher multiple, the better that you can be in these areas, um, the higher the multiple. So is your shop dirty? Does it look neglected, right? Is it, is it run down or are you running like a nice clean um, uh, operation? How long have your techs been there? Uh, we also have software. Uh, is, are, you, are you using a, are you basically running a, a 1980s data center in a closet in the shop or are, you know, do you have new technology running? And you, when you're looking to buy a shop, you almost want to go find a shop that is running um, really old systems and a ton of paper everywhere because you know you can go in, pull that out, implement a modern solution, and make a ton more money. Right. So if you're looking for a deal on a shop, you got to think that you're out there looking for a shop that is that is not up to speed on technology because you can immediately make a difference. But if you're looking to sell a shop, you want to sell for as much as possible. So scrap that and get into the modern age on your systems. Right? Yeah, so there's a saying, ditch the pen and paper. We see that time and time again. It's very hard to produce financials, but everything's on pen and paper. Yeah, And we see massive rev leak, right? So you're trying to bill out parts. They don't get translated properly. The markups are wrong. And it's, you know, the $6 calculator on the desk and a coffee cup full of pens and yeah. reams of paper. In my past life, I've been through many big business purchases, acquisitions, took a couple of companies public, and I've been through this due diligence process over and over. And I can tell you that um, one of the main reasons one company acquires another company is because they believe they're going to get synergies from this. They believe they're going to go in and clear out some of the um, bad processes and make a lot more money on that business than the sellers were making. Um, and then potentially turn around and flip it or something like that. So if you want to get the best value, don't be a target like that. Be a target that's just churning out a bunch of revenue that uh, can sell for a bunch. So keep that in mind. And there's also the owner consideration, right, Rick? So Absolutely. The, we talk about a shop in a box, right? Where, you know, the owner is free. I spent the weekend um, with a customer. They race. Um, and we were at an F1 track racing and they, they were able to do this on the weekends and have other hobbies because they're not tied down to the shop. In fact, they had some of their shop employees there too. And they were actually watching what's going on in the shop on their smartphone. Meanwhile, they're out there, you know, going 160, 170 plus on the track just for fun. And 
those are owners who are working on the business, not necessarily in the business. And that's the target, right, Rick? That's where we want to get. Absolutely. Absolutely. If, if the owner is required to be in the business to keep it running, then when the new owner comes in, um, if the business can't, you know, can't run without that pri prior owner, then, uh, you know, then, then that means trouble and, and, and less value. It, but if, if, it also depends on who's buying it. You know, there are some financial buyers, especially for a financial buyer who's just coming in and he maybe that financial buyer has some money and he's really interested in a shop, but he's not an expert in everything related to the shop. So he's going to want to come in, he or she's going to want to come in and buy a shop that pretty much runs, uh, not one that, oh my goodness, if the owner leaves, everything's going to fall apart. So it, 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 in every case, it's good if, uh, uh, you know, the, the business can pretty much run. Obviously, there's a lot of things that are required by the owner, the new owner is going to have to do, but having that uh, be able to run without them uh, for a period of time is, is really important. Yeah. And, and a lot of times they might even just uh, the business might be able to run on its own, but the owner um, has a lot of relationships. So just because you sold the shop doesn't mean you're free of the shop either. You might be on contract for six months or a year. A lot of times they'll even put out there two years. And it's really for all of that knowledge transfer, relationships transfer, um, really working with the business. And it can come by way of you being an employee at the shop you just sold or a consultant is what we often see. Um, the owner truly has some, some uh, magic in building that business that the new, the new buyer is going to want to leverage and maintain. Okay, so let's talk about how do you successfully and profitably sell your shop? I'm um, just going to launch another polling question here. Um, and it is, and you don't have to answer this if you don't want to. Um, are you planning on selling your shop? Um, yes, in the near future. Yes, but not for a while. No, or I've never really thought about it. But now you got me thinking. And even if, even if you're not going to sell your shop, you should be running it in a way that you will be selling it because it forces you to kind of, it's almost like having a little personal trainer on your shoulder telling you not to eat that donut or whatever. It's going to force you to do the right business practices and make better business decisions if you're thinking of it that way. Because well, you know, um, Jacob, uh, everybody has to leave their shop at some point in time. And sometimes it's not up to you. Um, you know, uh, things if happen. You, if you get hit by a bus, sudden, can your family uh, still be hit by a bus or, or a lot of other, you get sick or other things. And so to be, uh, to take care of your, you know, your loved ones and your family or who you're passing this to, it just makes sense to always be running it in a way that you're making as much money and, and running it as efficiently as you can. Absolutely. And it looks about half of them, half of the respondents are saying yes, but not for a while. 15% yes in the near future. Um, about 25% no, and the rest haven't thought about it. So let's go into the process. So selling your shop, you've increased the value of your shop, you've had it appraised, everything's in place, things are running like a well oiled machine. Now what do I do? You got to start by asking yourself some questions. Number one, what do you want from a sale? right? What are you looking for in a sale? Do you want to keep working at all? Or do you want to be able to sell it and be done? Do you want to keep your shop's legacy going by selling to a current employee? And um, how much money do you need to retire? So 100,000 a month in revenue, selling the shop for a million, um, if that's what you can get, maybe that's not enough to retire. So between now and three years from now, what can you do to increase the revenue, make the profit margins better, so you can get it to a two, two and a half, three million plus sale and start today, put in place a financial plan um, that will get you there. We've got a great one that you can download. It's free on our website. And it, in a way, I mean, um, that's kind of what we're here for with full base so that you can run this business like um, it's something that's going to be sold, whether you want to sell it or not to free yourself up as the owner to not have to be tied down. Chris, go ahead. Yeah. So should I, I guess, Rick, should I hire a broker to help me do this or should I just sell it myself? What, what, what's your advice for somebody who's considering selling their shop? You absolutely want to hire uh, a good broker. You want to go interview a number of brokers, find brokers that have sold similar businesses, ones that are reputable. Um, 
but you absolutely, you know, you've built this shop. I, what, what I've seen too many times is people say, hey, I built this shop. I understand this business. I, you know, I even know a couple of people might be interested in this business. Uh, I'm going to sell it myself. Why would I pay a, a, you know, a broker up to 10% of my, you know, 10 or 12% of my value in, in order to sell it? Well, the, the reason is, is because the brokers understand all of the different aspects. They, they'll help you really determine a, a selling price and understand how to add back the numbers to, to get uh, a correct EBITDA. They'll help you to, uh, you know, to, to point out the things that they've seen in other sales that make it worth more. They can find buyers all over the place. One of the, one op, one thing I saw, I, I a guy said, uh, you know, I know this business. I, I even know some sellers. There's three big companies around that buy companies like mine, and I, I'm not going to deal with a broker. Well, what he doesn't realize is that the broker might have uh, relationships all over the country. And guess what? He might know, or his office in California might know a company that's starting to roll up shops around the country. And they're willing to pay big bucks for that because they've got the infrastructure back in California and they're willing to pay 30, 40% more than, than the next guy would. And so yeah. um, very, very uh, strong that you should get a, a business broker or somebody to help you sell it because the other, th the other thing that happens when you start selling yourself is you take the eye off the ball. Yeah. You take your eye off the ball. You spend time selling your business instead of running your business. And all of a sudden your sales and profits go down at exactly the wrong time. Uh, they, they, the buyer comes in and says, well, geez, your sales seem to be trending down. Uh, I'm going to pay you much less. So just to keep your eye on the ball, you should be keeping that business, driving it even farther and harder, you know, during the, the sale process, not spending your time trying to, to do things that you're not that good at. And, and so, unless you've sold a lot of businesses. Um, so, so at the end of the day, you want to, a broker does their job if they get you a higher multiple than you would have gotten on your own. Absolutely. And then Jacob, yeah, on, and at a minimum, I'm thinking you would still need to have both a financial and a legal expert to help protect your personal interests, right? So a broker does their role of helping you sell, but then you still have these financial and legal obligations that you should have experts in. Yeah, exactly. And if, if you're on the buyer side, you also may be using a broker or dealing with a broker to find the right shop to buy, help you with that due diligence process and help with the negotiations and so forth. And all the things that uh, you may not think about that may be required, um, you know, environmental impacts of the land, are you taking a massive liability on yourself that you don't realize and, and so forth. And there's another consideration here, Rick, about selling to a current employee. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe we can talk briefly about this. Sure. Um, selling to employees, a lot of small businesses, that's how they're sold. They're not uh, just sold to outsiders, they're sold to insiders. And um, by having a good employee that really knows the business, you can, you can help teach them more aspects of the business. You can teach them some of the accounting and insurance and some of the back office types of things. Over the next couple of years, it, it allows the owner to be able to slowly transition out of the business. Uh, it gives you potentially of, of having someone that, uh, you know, that you can trust. Um, you know, I, I've even helped companies to actually find an outsider to now come in and be an insider that they're going to work with. You know, if there's, you don't have anybody today, it doesn't mean that you couldn't get somebody and, and over the next two years work with them. So a lot, a lot of lots and lots of small businesses end up selling to an employee. Makes sense. And um, the employee or whoever's buying can reach out for an SBA loan. These purchases can be financed, um, so on and so forth. And we actually have a checklist that you can download after the webinar that takes you through these basic things to, that you want to cover. So whether you're going to sell right now or not, or, or ever, it's, it's a good checklist to go through and make sure that you're doing the basics because it's going to make your business that much better. So that's available to download after the webinar. We'll send a follow-up email. And then as a bonus, if you're looking to purchase a shop, you basically do this whole process in reverse. 
And if you're a technician, consider finding a shop owner that would be willing to mentor you and sell their shop to you and um, do your due diligence and know the warning signs. So just to recap what we covered, we covered the calculation of the shop. Uh, we've got a shop valuation calculator that you guys can download after, re after the webinar, some tips on how to increase the value of your shop and what does the process of selling your shop look like? And if you're buying, what do you need to cover? So briefly, Full Bay, we are a platform for running a commercial repair shop, and we think we do a great job of it. Uh, we're growing very fast and getting great feedback from the community. And if you would like to see a demo of Full Bay, um, we have a uh, just a polling question. You can just uh, respond yes uh, to this. And it's good stuff, Rick. Um, I think a lot of shop owners uh, think about this uh, all the time, but maybe don't know what the path is. Your group, um, I've actually run into shops that use your group B2B CFO for um, accounting services and maybe mm -hmm. as they get bigger kind of to fulfill the CFO role sure. and, and so forth. So um, how can people reach out to you? Sure, you can reach out to me on uh, email, website. I'm on the, on, the, uh, on the web. My name is Rick Perrin with B2B CFO. We actually have partners in uh, about 40 plus states. Um, I can certainly help you no matter where you're at, but if you want somebody local, uh, many of my partners around the country could help you as well. B2B CFO. All right, thanks Rick. And uh, this month we are supporting the charity Prevent Child Abuse America. So for every full day sign up in April, we will be making a donation to PCAA. You can find more about Prevent Child Abuse America at preventchildabuse.org. And um, I think we got to the questions and we're short on time. Rick, thank you so much for, for yeah. helping us out and uh, look forward to speaking with you again soon. All right. Thank you. Take care. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks, Rick. Bye-bye.